So I think the best way to, that we could probably frame this for your audience would be typical schedule would be going to sleep somewhere between 9.30 and 11.30 yep. and waking up somewhere between you know 5.30 and 8 a.m., right? Mm-hmm. That's sort of typical schedule. And then the inverted schedule or the, the non let's call it the atypical schedule would be So there's a lot to unpack there that I want to dig into too. So you mentioned your sleep schedule and like now your dialed in sleep schedule is 10 30 to 11, wake up at six. Is that representative of what you like? That's a good day for you in terms of like, you're happy with a like seven hour to seven and a half hour, like total time in bed. And that equates yeah. to, do you use any like tracking devices, like an aura ring or a whoop or anything? You just go by no, general and- biofeedback, how you feel sort of thing. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, well, obviously sleep is so vitally important and so much of my online time uh, is spent telling people how to get better at sleeping. Um, so sleep is wonderful in that in the recovery sense, in the early part of the sleep, your first half of sleep is going to be mainly focused on physical recovery, but you, mentally you just can't perform if you're not getting enough of that REM sleep, which comes later in the night for everybody and more toward morning or whenever, what later in your sleep cycle, because I know uh, your sleep cycle is a little bit shifted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Derek, Derek uh, last name not to be named is, is mostly nocturnal, folks. So yeah. uh, at least for now, you know, but it obviously is working for you. That's one of my um, main goals is to fix that. Yeah. Oh, we can fix that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a more of a matter of, um, I don't know, just like something about the daytime. And when it's bright outside, I feel like, I know life is going on and being on when you're so sedentary on a computer, for example, for your work, it's very difficult to for me to focus when life is going on around me. So Mm. usually I excel the best when it's dark and I know people are asleep and my phone's not ringing off the hook and, you know, there's no emails coming in. I can really just like get my head down, get stuff done. But it's obviously problematic in maintaining a ideal circadian rhythm where I am pretty much the opposite of what is ideal frankly, like it's like literally the opposite side of like what I should be doing. And I do, I like at the times, the few and far between times I have maintained like a 10 to six schedule. It's interesting because I don't, I don't necessarily entirely trust the metrics on the aura rings or stuff like that. Like I don't, you know, believe they're entirely accurate. However, I do notice my sleep efficiency is superior whenever I've gone to bed at, you know, 10 PM versus four or 5 a.m. even if it's the same total time in bed and i'm just as tired um it's definitely easier to kind of like max out your rem and deep sleep components um and just in in general the quality seems to be better but i don't know if that's a result of like hypothetically i could pull like a ben greenfield i feel like and like biohack my environment put like all these like lights in my face and shit and like try and like fake that i'm on the proper rhythm but i think ideally like I assume this is actually one of my questions, but I assume I feel like I already know the answer is the difference between like somebody who works shift work and is forced to follow a subpar circadian rhythm, but otherwise still gets their eight hours in like the quality of that relative to somebody like yourself, who's in bed at like 1030 until six, like is in, does the literature reinforce that that's like, even if you're in bed for eight hours, it's impossible to replicate the same quality. Okay. So great, great question. First of all, um, it it varies by age. So when you're younger, shift work has less of a detrimental impact than it does when you're older. And this is because of some changes in the way that the pineal churns out melatonin, but also some other things that change as we age, like the lymphatic clearance of, which is like a washout system of the brain, but uh, that occurs during sleep. But, uh, you know, I think we could probably nail this with a, a couple key uh, findings. So first of all, if you are going to be on any sleep schedule, ideally you maintain that schedule for at least two weeks. So the worst thing in possibly in the world is the swing shift schedule where you're sleeping from 10 PM to 6 AM, like a typical person for three days. And then you're switching to sleeping all day and up all night and then back again, switching back and forth. That's so I guess shift, that shift work would be like where you, your shifts change, or is it like, like that's actually what that is. 
Okay. Yeah, sorry, I should have been more clear. No, the I should have been more clear. My bad. Bad yeah. question. <laughs> so, so, so I think the best way to, that we could probably frame this for your audience would be typical schedule would be going to sleep somewhere between 9.30 and 11.30 and yeah. waking up somewhere between you know 5.30 and 8 a.m., right? Mm-hmm. That's sort of typical schedule. And then the inverted schedule or the, the non, let's call it the atypical schedule would be going to bed very late, waking up in the mid morning or early afternoon and then, um, and so on. Um, swing shift is when people are switching between the typical and the atypical schedule Yeah, more often than every two weeks. And that causes not just disruption of the gut clock and liver clock and the circadian mechanisms that lead to indigestion and heart issues, it actually leads to such chronic increases in cortisol and such altered patterns of dopamine that in the brain that um, you can get mild psychosis in people that would otherwise be perfectly fine. You can exacerbate psychosis and depression in people that are, have a predisposition for them. You can see learning deficits. You, It's just really bad to do that swing shift. Now, if you are on a schedule of the sort that you described, like going to bed, I'm guessing around 3 a.m. and sleeping until you're right now. It's really bad, dude. It's like 5 a.m. to like one. Yeah. yeah, Ish. But so as long as you're getting that sleep and you're consistent about that schedule, it's probably, I I would say it's not a problem until it is right. Right. So for you, I mean, you're still training. uh, You'd still get your blood work done. Um, you know, you still maintain a healthy social life. You are involved, you do the supercar thing. Like you're, you're got, you've got things going on as far as I can tell. And you're, and you're very successful. So, I I mean, I had a schedule that wasn't quite that extreme, but was similar to that for many years. Um, Lex Friedman is, uh, follows a schedule of staying up late often and, and, uh, sleeping in late and waking up sometimes he'll switch, but, um, and sort of depends. So, I think there's a time for it when it's fine. Um, I think that in the long term, it's best to get to a more regular schedule, but some people are indeed night owls and prefer to go to bed late and wake up late. Um, some people do really well getting up early and going to bed at like eight thirty nine, which sounds dreadful to me. It just sounds like the worst schedule yeah. because um, I like, I like mornings and evenings. The one thing that is really valuable is that if people are feeling tired when they would like to be awake, then they need to change their sleep schedule. So I think that's the number one thing. And the true definition of insomnia is not that you can't sleep. It's that you're falling asleep during the day because you, or during the time when you would like to be alert because you're exhausted. Mm. And, um, and so at the sleep clinic at Stanford, they define insomnia by a number of metrics, but that's the primary one. And then of course I, I can mention a, a, a tool that's kind of useful that the, the, um, the psychiatry department at Stanford, we have a guy, our associate chair uh, developed this reverie app, R E V E R I. It's a hypnosis app, free app for Android and Apple phone that has self hypnosis scripts for focus, for sleep, for pain management. These are clinically tested. They're, they're actually quite good. They're short scripts. And, um, you know, for people that just can't sleep because of anxiety, I do think there are great things to take, but I think that are outside the prescription drug realm, uh, as you uh, of course know, and, and, uh, I know your, um, company, I did your company now has a new name. Is that right? No, no, that's a, it's a sister company. Yeah. Sister so that, company. yeah, it's going to be producing more like niche, different array of products, but it's, it's, for all yeah. intents and purposes, it is like Gorilla Mind still. It's just like a sister brand of the company. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So, you know, your sleep formulation, I've talked about some sleep formulations of that, you know, magnesium, apigenin related things. The similar things are in your, uh, I just got some of yours, so I'll try yours soon. So, um, but but in addition to that, I think people who can't sleep because they have a lot of anxiety um, can use something like Reverie, which will allow them to calm down and fall asleep more easily. And you use this away from sleep. You're training your brain to relax and to turn off thinking, which is kind of hard to do just by snapping your finger. Um, So it's a really, it's a good resource. And the, the um, data say that the speed to enter sleep and the uh, speed uh, and excuse me, and the duration and quality of sleep is, is quite good for people that use that every once in a while as a training tool. 
And then you asked about sleep monitor. So Whoop and Aura, uh, Whoop has um, support some of the work in my lab. So I want to be clear about that. I personally don't wear a Whoop. So sorry, folks at Whoop. Um, I, I just can tell when I'm waking up rested or not. And, and if I'm not rested, I tend to stay in bed. And yeah, I think some bit- people, they look too much at the minutia rather than it, like basic feedback of your body you know they'll spend all this time on like all these crazy devices and biohacking tools and they'll miss like basic shit like just get to bed at a reasonable time try to avoid blue light sleep for eight hours if you feel good it's probably working and they'll like get into like i have to have my grounding mat and like my if i don't have my chili pad and like my two thousand dollar light that i use in the morning and blah 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 like that kind of shit yeah. 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 And getting sunlight in your eyes when you first wake up or anytime you want to be awake. I mean, that's, a, that's such a powerful hardwired mechanism in all mammals mm-hmm. that it's, it's just, you know, that's the reason I, I probably, you know, I've said it so many millions of times on the internet. Now people probably roll their eyes, but I, I would say, you know, if you're not doing that, you're not really setting the clock. And so the rest of the stuff is secondary, but I agree. I think that if you're tracking things too carefully and you're too neurotic about it, then uh, what's coming from a device, then you lose the ability to develop intuition too about your own system. And, yeah. um, and look, if you're excited about the next day, you're not going to sleep as much. Yeah. And there's actually a study showing that one of the major determinants of focus and alertness and wakefulness is how excited you are about what you're doing. And it sounds almost like a, 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 like a duh kind of result. But what's very interesting is that even if sleep the night before is shorter, by an hour or two, if you have positive anticipation of the next day, the quality of the sleep, as as taken by EEG recordings, the quality of the sleep is actually much better. So there's something about, you know, there's a psychology to this stuff too. So I would hate for people to get so wrapped up and so neurotic about, oh, I only slept six hours. I don't know if I should train today. I don't know if I should study today. You know, I'm like, the body is resilient. You know, you don't want to drive yourself into chronic sleep deprivation, but, you know, you can still, you know, do do a 20 minute meditation, listen to reverie, drink an extra half cup of coffee and then hit it. No, it's, it's, you don't, you don't want to obsess. Optimal also includes being flexible. And this is something that I, I, I will, you know, give a nod to the folks in special operations because they don't get to plan for game day on Sunday. Like when it's time to work, they have to work. And so what they're really good at is understanding that optimization is really about doing things mostly right most of the time, sort of 80, 20. And then when it's time to lean into effort, you do it anyway. And yeah. you, you're a better person for it. And you, rather than tracking everything down to the tiniest, tiniest detail, that's, that's my feeling anyway. One thing that I kind of popped into my head and I want to bring it up before I forget, you were mentioning magnesium. Like you've talked about L3 and I particularly on your podcast numerous times. And like I've been interested for its applications, not just in a, um, like there's like this weird study on L3 and 8 that showed like anti DHT, like specific, something to do with hair loss prevention. It was very interesting. And then as well, um, I forget what the benefits are that you talk about how it differs from other magnesium formulations specifically. But one thing I wanted to bring up that I'm not sure if you've seen is, have you seen Rhonda Patrick's comments on L3 and 8 magnesium on the Joe Rogan show? She seems Uh, to think very poorly of it. She thinks you're just going to piss it all out is what she says. Oh, um, I didn't hear that comment. Um, So yeah, I, I mean, in my experience and my understanding and, and by, so there, and I'll mention the sources in a moment. Um, the, the scientific sources uh, that magnesium three and eight and magnesium bisglycinate are interchangeable in my mind, but that they are both superior to other forms of magnesium for sake of sleep because yeah. of the way that they cross the blood brain barrier and more of it is bioavailable. Now there's a, a guy who um, I knew way back when from the neuroscience synaptic physiology world. And I, a guy named Guosong Lu, who a very talented physiologist um, and then one of my colleagues at U- UCLA, Jack Feldman, who I've been in discussions with about some of the, the work on magnesium uh, three and eight for its cognitive enhancing effects and maybe neuroprote- maybe neuroprotective effects, also its anxiolytic anxiety reducing effects. Right. So all the data that I'm aware of point to better p- 
passage across the blood brain barrier, more effective at create, creating a little bit of mild sedation and reducing yeah. anxiety. And, you know, I, I, I should point out when I made the mention of magnesium three and eight on Rogan and on Tim Ferriss podcast and others. So I have no relationship to any company that makes magnesium three and eight. In fact, the one uh, relationship I have to a supplement company that's related to my podcast doesn't make mag three and eight. Yeah. <laughs> they make uh, this glycinate. So I'm not saying I don't collect on any mag three and eight purchases. I just want to make that clear. Um, but I, so I would say thousands of people now have written saying that that's been very helpful for them. About 5% of people um, find that it gives them some uh, gastric distress. They don't, um, you just have to figure it out for yourself. And then um, I would say that apigenin, the chamomile extract, um, all 50 milligrams of that seems to really accelerate the passage into sleep for, for a number of people. There, there is some question about what it, whether or not it impacts um, androgen or estrogen receptors, mate, you probably know more about Yeah, this it's uh, actually used concurrently with raloxifene to enhance the like pharmacologic activity of it quite significantly. That's what I'm most familiar with it. It's like an anti-gyno protocol involves raloxifene plus apigenin. And oh, I didn't, great. yeah, there, there's definitely some interactions with estrogen receptor antagonism perhaps, or exacerbating. I don't know if it's just, I forget exactly because it's been a while since I've looked at it, but it might even just like inhibit like hepatic clearance of drugs to make them more mm -hmm. pharmacologically active. I don't necessarily know how that would play into sleep hygiene though. Like, I guess it must have some other satellite interactions that are more related to what you're talking about specifically. Yeah. So on the, uh, the one I'm aware of is, are a few studies, a decent study showing that the Apigenin can increase the function of a chloride channel, which causes some hyperpolarization of the forebrain neurons. In other words, it yeah. turns off. It makes a little little bit of a mild a sedative. Um, uh, you know how mild. You know, 50 milligrams. I don't think is is terribly much, but it seems to be helpful for people. I suppose that for women or people who want to maintain an estrogen levels, then they might want to be a little cautious with apigenin. But I know a number of women that take apigenin and and don't rep uh, report. Um, you know, altered cycles or th things of that sort, but they're probably not checking that closely either. Uh, again, it'd be, you'd have, you'd have to do continuous blood work over many days. It'd be really complicated, but yeah, I think that sleep supplementation, um, the stuff that you've talked about and, and certainly that um, is in your supplement line for sleep, the sorts of things I talk about, I think people nowadays are really looking for things that are neither prescription drugs nor doing nothing right? Yeah. They, and I always say, get your behaviors right. You know, avoid blue light when you want to be asleep, get a lot of light when you want to be awake, et cetera, et cetera. Don't drink caffeine too close to when you want to sleep. The basic stuff, keep the room cool. But it's really terrific to see that some of these compounds that were so niche and thought to be only in, you know, the bottom, you know, corner of the shelf in the health food market and the person selling it to you just they didn't seem to make any sense when they spoke. Now there's some real data out there on yeah. PubMed. And, yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. But I'll, I'll ask, I don't know, Rhonda, I, I follow, obviously you know who she is. Um, I'll ask her what the basis for her statement is. I, I only yeah. know the literature I know. It was like urinary concentrations of it were like so dramatically high that her, her I don't want to misquote her, but it was something about she was very s skeptical if it was actually crossing the blood brain barrier when it was like, nearly identical the amount urinated out relative to ingested or something so she thought it was basic it was basically not being like assimilated properly after oral, oral ingestion just being excreted almost entirely but you know ultimately if you're seeing the manifestation of like real effects even if it's i don't know like i guess somewhat anecdotal like i guess you've probably seen the actual literature to support it too like reinforced concurrently with the anecdotal feedback but i mean i don't know if she's even tried it maybe her statement was just like based on that hmm. one study, which it sort of seemed like it might have been. But personally, I like yeah. this glycinate. And uh, I've used L3 and 8 before as well. And I don't know if I really noticed the giant difference personally. Yeah, yeah, I think they're interchangeable. I think that, um, you know, and I have recommended uh, L-theanine before sleep. Some people don't do well with L-theanine before sleep. It makes their dreams like so crazy that they don't like it. Um, yeah. Some people like it. I, I, I like really vivid dreams and um, it doesn't bother me. So there has to be some experimentation that one does for themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send, I'll dig up and send along that, that paper from Guasong 
uh, Lou, on the, uh, you probably are aware of them, the, the neuroprotective, potential neuroprotective effects. Um, those are pretty interesting. I mean, I think, um, uh, I can't help but say that one thing that you and I have riffed about before is uh, alpha GPC. Yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, that literature for neuroprotection and for cognitive enhancement is really um, strong. I'm curious, what do you, uh, how did you uh, get to alpha GPC and stum how did you stumble on it? And do you use it regularly or as part of a different formulation? 